Hey, welcome to episode 19 of Bloggers Are Weird. I am your host, DJ Paris, from the blog, thoughtsfromparis.com. Also, from the YouTube series, Osex, with Karen and DJ. This is a new show that we just started. We're actually recording episode two in just a little bit this morning, which stands for Opposite Sex, where she and I both give our masculine and feminine opinions. I I provide the masculine (laughs) on all sorts of questions related to sex, love, relationships, you know, really anything that's causing you distress. So we have a question today that I am a little afraid to answer that is pretty dirty. So I'm excited to do that show and also to continue to do this show. It's still a lot of fun. So a couple of things. First, I have a book out. So if you're on my website, thoughtsfromparis.com, just turn your eyes to the right, you'll see a book that I put out called Holy Crap, I'm Bathing in a Rose, only $2.99 available on Amazon. Check it out. It's not going to make me rich and it's not going to make you poor. So why don't you go ahead and buy it? All proceeds go to me, but that's fine. And then I'm also, speaking of the book, probably shouldn't say this in the same uh, sentence or breath as the (laughs) buy my book, but I'm actually going to be giving my book away free to 20 people once I hit 20 pounds of weight lost. I talked about this on a show or two ago, and I'm actually 11 pounds in, so I only have nine pounds to lose, and then I'm giving away 20 free copies. So don't wait, assume I'm going to fail. I'm no good with discipline, I can't stick to it. So go ahead and just buy the book or wait, and maybe you'll be one of the 20 free books given away. Also, I had a funny thing happen last night. So I wrote an article on my blog about a week ago called I Always Wear the Same Shirt to the First Date. And I started doing this after I had seven dates in seven days, which was just a random kind of crazy week that I didn't set up intentionally, but it ended up being seven dates with six different women on seven days. And I could not remember not only what I said to each person or what each person's background or backstory was, but I could not remember what I wore. And some of these dates were second dates. So I was worried because I thought, oh my God, What if I wear the same shirt twice? Now, I'm a guy, I don't care, but I know women notice those sort of things. So anyway, I wrote this story and I joked about how I've made it a mandate that I will always wear the same shirt on every first date. That way I can always remember, oh, I'm going out with so-and-so again, don't wear the plaid shirt. Do they make plaid shirts? (laughs) I don't have any. But anyway, don't wear the same goddamn shirt you wore the first time. But I could never remember. And I'm sure I wore the same shirt on multiple dates with the same person. So anyway, I wrote this story. I thought it was pretty funny. I got got some laughs and some good comments. And then I was out with my co-host, Karen, yesterday at doing this thing that we were doing during the day. No big deal. Came home late. My dates at... I had to leave at 7. I got home at like 6.15. And I ran into my closet. I grabbed the first shirt I saw that was, you know, reasonably attractive. Happened to be the exact same shirt I use on every first date. And then I got about halfway to my date and realized, oh my God, I'm wearing this shirt. What if she's read my blog? And then I thought, well, no, we haven't talked about my blog. There's no way she would have read it. So I'm okay. And I didn't do this intentionally, although normally I would do it intentionally. I'd wear the first shirt. But so I get to the date and I sit down and I go, you know, in my back of my head, I go, just in case, because I hadn't talked to this woman in about three weeks. So we had started talking, three weeks went by, and then we finally set up a date. And I didn't remember our first conversation or not much of it. And I thought, well, I better mention just in case she happened to see my blog. I don't publicize my blog in these dating sites. It's just sometimes it comes out in conversation. So I thought, I better just cover my ass. So I said, you're not going to believe this. I wrote this post and she stops me. She goes, oh yeah, you're wearing your, the date that you wear on every first date. You're sorry, you're wearing the shirt you wear on every first date. And I said, yeah. And then I explained totally, you know, accidental. And I said, you've, you've been to my blog? And she goes, yeah, I've read a bunch of your stuff. And I said, oh my God, I'm so embarrassed. I can't believe I wore this shirt. I, I, that was, you know, kind of a joke when I wrote that article. I was, I, I do, sh- I should wear the same shirt every first day, but it was really kind of mostly a joke. And she said, don't worry about it. And then she said, well, you, and you'd read my blog too. And I had completely forgotten that this woman has a blog and I've read, read it and I've, you know, it's fantastic and <laughs> whatever. So this was not a great way to start a date. She was basically saying, yeah, we talked about your blog. I've watched your videos. I've seen, you know, some of your 
um, some of your writing and you've read mine. And I was like, you have a blog? So this is, now it's, I'm going to write a post called, I have to start taking notes. So I'm going to have to be one of those jerks that takes notes when I talk to somebody. And it's not like I'm dating a million women where it's just, you know, who can remember what. So today on the show, we have one of my favorite people that I have never met in person, but I've written with her. I've talked with her a bunch and I really, I adore her. Her name's Rachel Thompson. She and I have done in a series on my blog called Rachel and Delphin Argue About You, which is really fun. So you can search for that. And she is also the author of now three books, but I'm guessing probably a fourth is on the way. She's written bestsellers like Man Code Exposed, Walk in the Snark, Who Nourished One is Broken Pieces, and she's a friend. I love her to death, and I'm excited to talk with her. So grab a thimble full of Sambuca or whatever your drug of choice is. Mine are chunks of turkey breast with barbecue sauce that I had for breakfast this morning. It was awesome, don't judge me. And sit back, relax, and enjoy. Today's podcast is sponsored by romance-text.com. Looking to reignite the passion in your relationship? You have to check out romance-text.com. Com. This is how to use text messages to bring back the passion and reignite the spark you once had. Now, if you're thinking this sounds cheesy or maybe it's just learning how to send dirty text messages, it's actually not. This program by relationship expert Michael Fiore has been featured in over 200 television and radio shows. This program has a money-back guarantee. is normally $97, but listeners of Bloggers Are Weird get a special price of only $47 for the entire program. By purchasing the program, you help support this show. Visit romance-text.com and get the passion back. I mean, I think the book has done so well because it's really struck a chord with people who have suffered some kind of sexual abuse or sexual assault. I don't know if you've read it, but I mean, it talks about love um, overall as a general theme. But, you know, when I was 12, I was um, molested by a neighbor and I carried that around for a really long time. So I never talked about it. So then when I talk about it here, it's the first time I've really ever publicly shared that. And it's made it easier to talk about, you know, I would have never told you this two years ago, right? Sure. So, um, but the, the response has been amazing. I mean, people are coming out of the woodwork sharing stories with me that are just so heartbreaking. So I think it's worth bringing up, you know, sexual abuse. Um, especially with children. And this happens to be Sexual Assault Awareness Month right. through April. So it's it's good timing. I also took the book free today and tomorrow as part of a promotion I'm doing on celebrating women with five other female authors. And so, you know, I, it's, it's probably good just to say, you know, hey, if you want to go get the book, it's totally free for the next couple of days. So I am uh, talking with Rachel Thompson, author of three books currently available on Amazon, Man Code Exposed, Walk in the Snark, and Broken Pieces. And uh, so welcome, Rachel. Thank you very much. Lovely to be here. <laughs> Great. What, uh, what, do you ha- what are you going to read for us today? Well, my book, uh, Broken Pieces, is out now. It came out in December, and um, I thought I'd read just they're, – they're mostly short essays, some poetry, some prose. And um, there's a free sample available on Amazon. So I'm going to read from the fr- very first part of the book that most people can go read themselves if they'd like. But it's kind of fun to read my own stuff. I never get to do that. So go ahead. Okay. So the first one, um, I'll give you a little background. Is that okay? Um, sure. It's called China Doll. And this is uh, about my ex who killed himself about three years ago. We were no longer together, but we were talking at the time. So it's called China Doll. I felt the storm break in my heart. Maybe I knew he had taken his life before I got the call, perhaps even before he left. His words a warning I didn't know how to catch. I can admit that now. Before he died, when we spoke, a storm brewed in his words. He had lost so many people, some he hated, some he loved, but still so many deaths. Drinking ruined him, Alcohol killed his marriage, twisted his relationship with his young son into sadness. He only told me bits and pieces, his language sparse, as if he had created his own. I gleaned as much as I could from every conversation, 
trying to understand unspoken words, held breaths, if only I had read between his lines. If I closed my eyes, would I, could I have touched his words? See who I am now, he angrily shouted, though his rage was couched between desire and love. I'm not that man anymore who would hurt you. You're my China doll. He carried me for 20 years, freezing me in time, taking me out, looking at me before putting me back on his shelf. Who he thought I was, not realizing I would grow and change, becoming a different person a stronger person, a doll who didn't break quite so easily. The mind warps what time cannot forget, but I will never forget. And I am not his doll. I am not fragile. Then again, <clears throat> excuse me, then again, I'm not the one who broke. And that's China doll. That's very nice. Thank you. Very sad. Mm. It was very sad. And, um, most people had no idea that he was having the kind of difficulties that he was. And, and we found out afterward that he had actually made some previous attempts, which was just so shocking to me because he was just such a strong, vibrant person. Uh, you know, he walked into a room and, and all eyes went to him, you know. So it is. The whole thing is just very sad. And it's quite a departure from your other two books, which were pretty light and, and you know, more, uh, they, they were humor. Yeah. Um, the first book, A Walk in the Snark, had some serious pieces in it. And it, he had, I mean, really, when I started writing that book, I was actually talking to him at the time on Facebook and emails and things. He had reconnected with me. So he had committed suicide probably, oh, three months prior to the release of the book. So I, you know, was just pouring my heart and soul out and I included a few of those pieces in there, maybe four um, out of, you know, like 30 or 40 pieces. So um, there's a hint of that in the first book. The second book, of course, is just totally humor where I talk about men and women and relationships and sex and chocolate and <laughs> martinis. And it's very much my sense of humor. Um, but as I got to writing the third book, um, it's actually, there's, it's a three book series, uh, called the Chronicles of Snark. And I started writing the third one called Chick Speak Uncovered. And I just didn't have it in me. I just had so much that I felt I needed to share that I just put that aside and started writing Broken Pieces. And, and then I released that last December. And how's the reception been by your readers who are, you know, used to a different side of you now getting a more personal and intimate uh, view of, of, you know, what's going on? Yeah, you know, it's been amazing. I think for everyone who, you know, has lived a life, of course, we all have, um, we've had good moments and bad moments. And most of the bad moments you experience, perhaps you don't share that with somebody because it's technically not talked about in polite society. Uh, I think writers in general, if you give yourself permission to talk about these things, it, it makes it easier for people then to relate because they've had these experiences that maybe they've never spoken about. So what I did was prior to, well, during the writing, I mean, it took me almost a year to get the next book out with, you know, just life in general, moving and everything. Um, I started kind of pre-branding, getting my audience used to the fact that I wasn't just going to be writing humor or social media, which a lot of people know I do that with my business, um, Bad Redhead Media. So I started having guests come on, uh, sharing real life experiences, and they've been amazing. I mean, I, the one thing I said was it can't be hilarious or funny. I'm going for real life stuff, not to exploit people in any way. Um, I've even done some anonymous posts because I, you know, people weren't comfortable revealing so much. But it's wonderful to give people a platform and saying, here, you have permission to say whatever you want. And people have talked about kidnapping, stalking, rape, mental illness, um, sexual assault, just all kinds of really serious life topics that part of many of our everyday lives. So doing that kind of pre-branding, I think, helped people understand the direction I was going. Plus, I shared some excerpts as I went along and, and asked for feedback. And so people were very aware that it wasn't humor. 
And, you know, one of the things that I've always been most impressed with you when you talk about branding is your ability to market. And it seems like everyone's got a book, a book these days mm-hmm. online. Mm-hmm. Can't, it's like every other tweet I get is please, you know, visit and read my book. And mm-hmm. I, um, I'm amazed at, you know, how well you've been able to get your name out there and market. Uh, can you, I have a lot of listeners that are, that are writers, you know, what advice would you have for them or how did you get started writing? I've always been a writer. I mean, I started when I was 10 years old and uh, I was a journalism minor in college and um, I would have done creative writing, but at the time the, the college I went to did not have that as an option. So I ended up with communication studies and that was fine. And then I ended up going into sales, you know, got to, girls got to pay the bills. Right. But, you know, I think having done that, I did that for about 15, 18 years sales and marketing in in the pharma industry, it gave me a really good understanding and background of effective ways to sell. And if you think about it, I mean, a book is a product, people pay money for it, they, you know, can write a review about it. So I think the mistake many authors make is that they just approach it from the author perspective. Here, I've built it, now people will come and that rarely, if ever happens. And then they go on social media and it's just this constant barrage of buy my book, buy my book, like me, review me, do this, do that, where you're asking people to do stuff who don't even know you. And so what I've learned, excuse me, if you put, if you go back to my pharma career and my writing career is um, it's, it's kind of a, I've sort of, I'm, I'm writing a book myself about social media and author marketing, but I say it's a process of combining um, relationship selling and relationship marketing with your product as opposed to the hard sell. And that definitely makes a huge difference in learning. Most people get on social media and they think, well, if my 13-year-old can do it, I can do it, right? But it's not just, you know, buy my book, buy my book. Like I call it Bart Simpson syndrome, right? Look at me, look at me, look at me. And it, it just doesn't work. People get annoyed, annoyed by that. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, you're right. And there, there really is nothing more annoying than getting a tweet from somebody who you don't know very well saying, hey, come check out my book on Amazon. Mm-hmm. Because, but if that person would have said, hey, I see that you read a lot of humor blogs. Mm-hmm. I wrote a humor book. Mm-hmm. Check it out. Mm-hmm. You know, it has to be niche specific. It's got to be targeted to that audience. And, you know, what I've always said is, of course, content is king, but if your content doesn't get in front of many eyeballs, then, then, you know, you're not going to grow as you're not going to grow your audience. So you have to have that marketing strategy of where do the people that are would buy my book hang out? Yes. How do I build a relationship with them? That's with integrity. Yeah. And then how do I gain their trust? And then are they going to just, you know, give me a shot and look at my stuff? And then hopefully from there, you know, the the proof is in the pudding. Either they like it or they don't. Yeah. In fact, I just read this statistic from the Georgia Institute of Technology, and they looked at millions of tweets and uh, stream owners, you know, people. And they found that the people that were most successful were providers of information and resources. And those who were doing that, gosh, sorry, that kind of hard sell were not successful in that they didn't have as many retweets or followers. They look specifically at that. So those are some good hard numbers. And to take a look, I tell people that I work with, look at your last 20 tweets that, that you sent out. And were they retweets? Were they, was it content, a quote? Was it just all links to your book? It's a very good short little test to see how you're doing. What is your ratio of promotion to content? Yeah, I saw there was a study I saw that that looked at Justin Bieber and it said you should be averaging uh, six retweets for every post for every 30,000 followers you have so in other words which is very hard to do by the way Um, because I write I think I write pretty funny tweets and I still if I can get six retweets I've got about 54,000 Twitter followers if I can get six retweets I feel pretty good about that Mm -hmm. and but that's, you know, there were some numbers to shoot for. And I went, wow, like, um, you know, if you can get people to retweet based on your content mm-hmm. uh, versus just your promotion, then, you know, wow, you're doing great. And that's why, you know, you and I are big fans of Triber, mm-hmm. um, which is really designed to do just that. Yes, 
Absolutely. And I think also, you know, when you look at Google and your ranking, there's a, there's a somewhat new thing called author rank or authorship. Mm-hmm. People refer to it as both. And they do look at your social media influence and they don't really look at how many followers you have, although it does count to a certain extent. But because that's so easily manipulated, they, they look more at retweets. How many retweets are you getting? And that affects your social influence ranking. And so it's important, you know, and one one really kind of cool way to, 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 <clears throat> sorry, to, I guess, manip- you're not manipulating it, but to track it, I guess, is to um, subscribe to Favestar. I don't know if you're on that. It's F-A-V star. And then I think it's dot F-M for whatever reason. And if you can really check, um, they'll say it's a little bot that sends out uh, you know, a notice to you, if three or more people have favorited your tweet, faved your tweet, you'll get a little notice. And then you can go check and see how many faves and how many retweets you've actually gotten. So it's kind of a neat little check. Yeah, that's, no, that's really cool. I, I've not done it. I'm doing it right now while we're talking. But that is, um, <coughs> excuse me. I, I love to know, I, I get a lot more favorites than I get yeah. retweets. Yeah. What now if if I now I do have a book. My my book's a little different. It's just a best of collection of my mm-hmm. blog but uh from 2012. But um if I had an original piece of of work mm-hmm. and I have my audience on my blog and I've got my Twitter followers and my Facebook fans, mm-hmm. what would be my the you know, you what would be your cuz you have bestsellers. So what would be your recommendation for somebody who had a has a book who's just starting out and figuring out how to market it? Well, I think I'd go back to focusing on the writing before you ever even think about releasing it. Make sure that you have, you know, if you can't afford an editor, you know, and I I truly believe it's an investment in yourself. So you really should be able to afford an editor and just stop going to Starbucks. But if you just positively can't have other people look at it for you, whether they're from Twitter or Facebook, to catch any kind of mistakes. I mean, at the very minimum, your book should be proofed and formatted correctly. Um, but if you can pay for a content edit, I think that makes such a huge difference. Um, I, I, in my first book, I, there were things that my editor pointed out to me that I didn't even notice, themes and, you know, just various things. That I, it can be almost transcendent, not to sound too like woo-woo, but I think it's worth it. So if you can go back to making sure that you're, think of it as a product, is the best possible product it can be, then you really need to look at your entire platform, even before you release. I always tell people six months prior to release is the perfect time to start marketing your book because you need to be focused on finding readers, as you said, that are interested in your genre or your topics and start interacting with them, send them excerpts, have them beta read your book. You know, it, it takes work to market your book. But again, if you focus on the relationships as opposed to, you know, directing people what to do, you'll get more interaction that way. And eventually you'll get more book sales. And have you gotten a chance to go back to uh, finish your trilogy? You know, of Star? I have not because I'm focused so much now on the marketing of broken pieces and my business that what I'm actually doing, I get I get requests every day now that I've built up my business over the last 18 months um, that um, people want to know what I do, how I do it. So I'm actually taking my blog posts from Bad Redhead Media and updating and editing and all that and putting it together so that I can send it to my editor and we can, you know, content edit and do all that stuff. So that will be my next book is, you know, like how not to market your book, probably more than anything, because of all the mistakes that I see. And then after that, um, yes, then I will finish uh, Chick Speak Uncovered, and I'm planning a Broken Pieces Part 2. It's just resonated so much with people. I truly had no idea the response to this book. I thought people would just think, oh, it's just some chick writing about her teenage poetry, which it's not, but, you know, people make assumptions and it, it, it's just done better than I ever imagined. What, and, and why do you think that it's, it's, uh, it's exceeding your expectations? You know, I think because there were a few things I had to get to the point in my life where I was ready to share some of the really difficult things that I experienced 
like um, my being molested by my neighbor when I was 12 years old. And it didn't just happen once. And it, it didn't just happen to me. And eventually, you know, he got caught. He was tried. He only got two years. Um, but he also actually was in the army. So I had to testify twice. And because I was one of the older girls that this happened to, I was able to give a voice to the types of things that he did. And I don't go into explicit detail in the book. I was very conscious of not wanting to have it be salacious in any way. Um, and also, I didn't want it to be a trigger for people because I figured, you know, based on some of the reactions of my beta readers, it's very strong. It, hit, it, it, it hits a chord with people, especially people who've experienced sexual abuse at a young age um, or who have experienced that from a sibling or a, you know, ch uh, when a child. In one case, a woman came to me and told me that um, some uh, one of I, I don't want to shared too much, but her children had been molested by someone she knew very well, and it, she had to walk away from the book. So, you know, I was conscious of it being a trigger, and but I felt at this point I needed to really share that kind of information and, and show that even though it happened, it, I'm not a victim. I've lived a, a full life. I, ha I am living a full life. I have children. I'm married 20 years. You know, I have a successful writing career and a business. And so you can move beyond that. So my goal was to make it more a book of hope as opposed to just a book of look at me, I'm a victim, kind of exploiting me myself. And I think, I hope it seems to really, um, like I said, strike a chord with people. And have you found that your readership or the readership of the new book is the same, uh, the same readers of the previous two books? You know, in some cases, yes. In many other cases, I'd have to say no, because I have so many new followers every day on Twitter and Facebook and Google Plus. I have, you know, pretty uh, widespread platform and I'm, people will find me in all kinds of different ways. Um, so I think you never know. I mean, I have an idea of who my demographic is, primarily women, but a lot of men are reading the book. And it's a one guy said to me, you know, my sons are young. He's like, but I will make them read this because they need to know how to treat women and how not to treat women. So I love that. I thought that was great. But I did not know him previous to this book. Well, that is quite a quite a compliment. Yeah. Um, so and also if now today is the 28th and so the book is actually free today the 28th and also tomorrow the 29th or yes. just today. Yes, it's it's Amazon exclusive. Uh it's ebook format at this time. Um but again, you don't need a Kindle to read an ebook from Amazon. They have free apps for your smartphone, your computer, your tablet, whatever. Um, so anyone can read it. Even if you have a nook, you can read Kindle ebooks. I get this question a lot, which is why I'm talking about it. Um, so anyone can benefit from the free books that Amazon allows us to uh, create for readers. And it's normally five ninety nine. Um, and again, it's been out four months. I've got almost a hundred reviews and I got, you know, five stars from the Midwest Book Review. It's been nominated for a global ebook award for nonfiction. So I'm just really, you know, happy to get it out there. And if people can read it and it helps them in some way, then I'm happy to put it up free. And so, and I'm part of a, an event called Celebrating Women. We have a, a website called herbestbooks.com and we're giving away an iPad mini and gift cards and gift baskets and all kinds of cool stuff. So if people want to go directly there to enter, they can. And if they just want my book, they can just go to Amazon and look up Broken Pieces by Rachel Thompson. Or they can get your other two books as well. Yes, those are not free, um, but they're only two ninety nine each. So it's not like, you know, you're paying $25 for a book or anything. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And those those did extremely well, too. Uh, those yeah. were bestsellers, you, both, uh, correct? Yes. Um, it took a while for the first one. You know, and I think this is a, a good example for any new author. You know, your book's not going to become a bestseller overnight. It took a good nine months for my first book, A Walk in the Snark, to even rank on a list. And I did a ton of marketing for that. Um, and then finally, it, it got it latched onto the motherhood list and the parenting and families because I talk a lot about being a wife and a mother um, in humorous ways. 
And it's basically stayed there. And that was in 2011. Um, so I released it in January. And by September, it was on the list. And it stayed on that list. Uh, even now, it's on one of the lists. So it's just great. Um, and then the second book I released in December of 2011, which was Man Code Exposed. And by then, it took maybe a month for it to hit number one on the um, several lists, actually. And that was really so eye-opening to me because we always say, you know, how do you, how do you sell more books? Write another. That's from my friend Ryan Pearson. And it's so true. I mean, it only took a month for it to get to that point. And then with um, Broken Pieces, I mean, really within a matter of a week or two, it was already ranked. It was, it's been number one and number two on poetry and women's studies. Um, and that's just been amazing. It just happened so fast. But I think that's a testament to the relationship building that I do more than anything. And having a good book, you know, I mean, it, it went through, <laughs> you know, I mean, it, I, I did the editing and proofreading and formatting, but if your book is not good, then you need to go back to square one and be honest because you will hear about it. Um, and I had about 30 beta readers. So I think this was the most sort of tested book before it ever saw the light of day than my previous two. And I'm, I'm, I would recommend that anybody do that. Yeah, that's great. Well, I very much appreciate you coming on the show today. Uh, if people want to follow you, uh, first thing they can do, of course, is go buy the books. Just go on to Amazon, search for Rachel Thompson, Broken Pieces, um, Man Code Exposed, and Walk in the Snark are the three currently available. Mm -hmm. Then you could also visit badredheadmedia.com, which is your business, mm -hmm. and also your social media blog. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, on, on Twitter, it's Rachel in the OC. Mm -hmm. And where, where, how can they find you on Facebook? Um, it's just Rachel. And, uh, I think it's Rachel Thompson author um, is my page. And then there's a, a fan actually started a broken pieces page so that people would have a place to talk about, you know, their difficulties, whether it's sexual assault or suicide. So they can actually go and, and look me up there as well. And on Twitter and Facebook, I have both Rachel in the OC and Bad Redhead Media. So you can find me under either one. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. I appreciate you having me on, DJ. All right. We'll say goodbye, Rachel. Bye, everybody.